recording to the cloud. All right, here we are, Sarge. We're live. Okay, cool. Hey, uh, hello. Hi. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> All right, that's enough of that shit. Um, I am DM Dave, and joining me here is Sarge, and this is the very first episode of Read the Fucking DMG podcast, video cast, Zoom cast, if you will, in the age of COVID, um, that we will be uh, essentially just taking questions from our patrons, uh, answering them to the best of our ability without rambling too long, and uh, hopefully educating the masses on uh, the fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons, as well as, of course, the fucking DMG. <laughs> we will do um, our best not to ramble. We do that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I am not going to do I'm going to ramble. I'm going to ramble so much. <laughs> uh, so the uh, um, I'm DM Dave. I, of course, um, if you don't know me, I run DM Dave, uh, patreon.com forward slash DM Dave. I'm a professional fifth edition content creator. Um, by professional, I mean, we've actually got a staff and producers and all that shit it's pretty cool <laughs> it's a lot of us uh, <laughs> yeah sarge tell them who you are sarge i'm sarge i'm from new orleans i met dave in another DD server and mentioned that there were a bunch of errors on one of his adventures and he's like hey not why true. did you come help me out then and then i did and now i'm here <laughs> it's not true i'm i'm typo free y'all grammarly like, you're good dog <laughs> A year later, there's a bunch of other writers. Back. A year later, there's a bunch of other writers and other staff people, and we're doing way more than just fixing typos in Dave's adventures now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're mostly just uh, like getting a laser pointer and getting me to go the right way. <laughs> right. <That's laughs> Everybody's job is to, like, my name may be on the company, but I am hardly the boss. I am. <laughs> That's the job. You got to trick Dave into doing the things he says he needs to true. do. <laughs> That's true. Well, uh, all right. So last night we did a poll on our Patreon. Um, oh, and of course, now that we're going to put this on YouTube, make sure to, uh, what do they, what do the kids say these days, Sarge? They got to like smash, and subscribe, like, ring that bell, like, <laughs> smash it. <laughs> I don't know. My, my kid watches a lot of Minecraft videos. We're not going to yell at you like those guys do. I, I hope maybe, I don't know. Does that sell like <laughs> but anyways yeah yeah go ahead and uh, follow us if you like we're gonna create try to create more of these all, all the time answering hot questions that our patrons want to know um and then yeah like us so we can uh, pop up in the search listings and be super cool um all right enough of that bullshit um sarge yes what's our what's our first question yeah it was really fun seeing what everybody asked uh we'll start with the basics um since people are always asking us anyway they want to know how we got into D D in the first place. Oh. Oh. Uh that's a cool question. Um so way back in nineteen ninety one, I think it was, back when OJ was still beloved by America and uh <laughs> And I was a baby. <laughs> Reagan was no, no. Bush, <laughs> GW Bush was president, and the Terminator Two hadn't even graced our film screens yet. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I was, God, I think I was ten years old, and was at the mall. Um, and this is back when they had bookstores in mall because we went to B Dalton Books, which I don't think even exists anymore. And I've heard of it? <laughs> yeah, they had a, um, you had, you had B Dalton's and Walden. Uh, books in this uh, mall which was the um i think it might have been uh the cloverleaf mall in virginia which is now like a uh, parking like a parking lot overgrown with weeds like there's adventurers going there and shit and fighting goblins that are hanging out there i mean that's how abandoned this place is um but back then it was kind of like the spot you went you went to malls right in you know bc before covid and the <laughs> they had a section dedicated just to, to fantasy. And then like most bookstores, especially like Barnes and Nobles and stuff, like the last section of shelves is dedicated just to role-playing games. And back then there were really only like two role-playing games, right? You had uh, D&D pretty much. And I think Vampire the Masquerade was just starting to roll out. Maybe I think in the early nineties, I don't know, I have to look through that, but mostly it was D&D. And they had, um, I, 
I always talk about this and I never seem to get it, but they, they had a big black box with a big red dragon on it painted by, um, I'm pretty sure it was Larry Elmore. Um, and it was the Dungeons and Dragons new easy to master Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, what's it called? Game. <laughs> and, <laughs> looking like, the, looking that forward on the... <laughs> Game. Um, yeah, so I got started with that and it's pretty cool. It's uh, all in one box, had a bunch of like paper minis that you folded and had to like tape at the bottom. And if you sneeze, they all blew away so you had to tape pennies to the bottom of them and uh came with like a, f a fold out mat of the dungeon and uh it was pretty rad uh i started as a dm and my brother kevin would always play with the players and it was pretty much that was the way it was and we started buying other dnd stuff i don't think we played a lot of it a lot of it was just like cool to own so like ravenloft as a campaign setting was just starting to come out around this time so we we got like the ravenloft starter set um, I think we got some Spelljammer stuff because that was like still relatively new because that came out in like the late 80s. Uh, yeah, it's cool. Big second edition fan. Uh, pretty much then when I moved in with my roommates um, when I was like 19 or 20, we did a lot of D&D because that was the time of 3.0 and 3.5. I bought a lot of books at the local bookstore or local game shop for like half off. They were all like ding and dent books. And then... Um, what happened after that? Uh, I somehow skipped fourth. And then 2018, I think I was watching Stranger Things with my wife. And I was like, damn, I want to do D&D &D again. <laughs> and then I got into D&D &D again. And then like three years later, I'm somehow doing it for a living. So that's so, kind of so the... surprising how many people get back into the hobby because of Stranger Things in the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, it really it really did it for me because I I had stopped playing and got into board games pretty heavy like after I sobered up back in like 2011, and I, I ended up selling all my books to start an Amazon business in 2015. So all my third edition books I had like tons of them like the shell I had like these cheap Walmart shelves and they're all like bowed under the weight of like those massive brown tomes from uh, <laughs> third edition, and then I got rid of all of them and I regret it now because I had some that are like super out of print and. Uh, but then, yeah, like I, I, I was like, all right, I'm getting back into this. I went to the library once and I think I got fourth edition. I was like, I'm not sure this is D and D it's pretty, but I don't think it's D and D <laughs> no fits to you fourth edition people out there. I mean, but, uh, then I got into fifth edition. Uh, I bought the books for MSRP at the shop here in Oklahoma. And, uh, yeah, I mean, ta-da, here I am. So that's my story, Sarge. My story with D and D is a lot shorter than Dave's. I didn't, I wasn't, I wasn't day. involved really... with D&D &D, um, until I was honestly an adult. I think I played like half of a session on the bus when we were on a road trip once when I was a teenager and it didn't make any sense to me because I just kept failing things and I didn't understand why. And I'm like, <laughs> why do I want to play this game where I just get told I failed all the time? This seems lame. Um, That's life, I've, Serge. That's life, pal. <laughs> I think sometime around 2000, maybe 13 or 14, because I don't remember when 5th edition started, but I know early in 5th edition, a buddy of ours, because I was in another online gaming community, they asked us to try out Horde of the Dragon Queen because he wanted to try out D&D, &D, and a bunch of us who had barely or ever played D&D &D got together and tried to run it. And it was kind of a mess because... Now that we now that fifth edition is mature, we can we can look at the weaknesses of Horde of the Dragon Queen and recognize how they like even at the time Watsy wasn't ready for a lot of new players to come to the game. Uh, yeah, so it we had poor rule, didn't it? it did it come up. Um, yeah. It it was a little bit rough, and that group kind of fell off because DM had a hard time prepping content and got a little overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a lot of fun stories that come out of that. We'll probably talk about that in a future game, uh, in the future, in a future <laughs> podcast. Future game. Yeah, game, game's the word of the day. I know, I know. Game. We couldn't, we keep messing it up. And game. so I can, we walked away from it for a bit. And then we were playing like random, like tabletop board games. We picked up um, a deck builder from Catalyst Games called uh, Dragonfire, which is a D&D &D deck builder. Mm -hmm. uh, which is pretty cool. Like, I think deck builders are fun. I think there's an interesting meta oh, yeah. terms with them. I think it's a it's a little really like collaborative tactical experience with folks. Uh, but after we kind of burned through that, the players were bugging us, bugging me to run D and D again, <laughs> and so I just sucked it up. And then I bought Lost Mind of Endelver in like two thousand. 
2018. That was right around the time I got re-involved with D&D. Another buddy of mine from high school had hit me up and he had me join his Curse of Straw table. We wiped mm-hmm. in Death House. <laughs> and then, like so many do. And then we rolled shadows, up. Right? And then it was Shadows. Yeah. It was Shadows and our Paladin was only, we were only level two, so we didn't have any like channel divinity to make them go away. And we got yeah. caught and wrecked. Uh, but that, that group didn't survive COVID, unfortunately. That was a bummer because we had to just hit level yeah. six. Uh, but now that I'm here with now I'm here with Dave, I, we were I was running that game and I, we noticed Griffin on Instagram, and that eventually led me to Dave because of their ads. And now yeah. I neurotically yell at people to read the DMG every day. <laughs> yeah. He just yells at me. It's not even about the DMG. He's just you're yelling all right cool thanks sarge um all right well that's our that's our origin story i mean we'll probably go into more of that in later episodes but uh what's our what's our second question now yeah following up on that something people ask us a lot because people want to see what we could do in other stuff they want to know why do we like D more than other systems out there uh money mostly you know it makes us money <laughs> <laughs> I mean, kind of joking, but not. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's it's the most popular system in the world, obviously. Um, we have some data from some of our, our pals in the business. And uh, about 55% of all people who play on VTTs play D&D primarily on it. Uh, Pathfinder comes in second. And let's face it, Pathfinder is just D&D 3.75, I guess you could call it. Um, since Pathfinder spun off from D&D when they went to fourth edition. Um, I don't know, man. I, I like D&D and I think there's a lot of things they do really, really smart with it. And I think fifth edition has really kind of figured out, um, some of its past weaknesses. <clears throat> They're not oversaturating the market. Uh, they let us third party people do that for them. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, sure. you know, they only put out like, God, like two or three books a year and then some like assorted products. Um, it's very, um, I think it's a little bit more marketing driven than past editions. Like you can really tell that by trying to branch out with getting Magic the Gathering players involved with uh, the Ravnica and Theros books, uh, as well as like tying in like Rick and Morty and uh, Matt Mercer's worlds <clears throat> and all that shit. So, um, I mean, I think that's probably my biggest criticism of them, but uh, the content's pretty tight. They've really done a great job in fifth edition of sort of seeing what works and uh, seeing what didn't work in the past, improving upon it. And even in this edition in itself, um, the books continually get better and better. Like Sarge said about, you look at like the first books that were put out, you know, they're kind of like all over the place. Now, arguably that's because the rules weren't really like solidified yet. But um, even between like, I'd say like something like Avernus, uh, which came out in what the end of like 2019. Yeah, uh, I think so. Cause I, I remember I was in, it must have come out around I think in on September of it had to be around September of nineteen because I was in Toronto for the film festival. And yeah. I remember reading about the Abyssal Chicken while watching a tennis match. <laughs> yeah, and then <laughs> like it uh shit, what was I gonna say? Oh, um and then and Rhyme, Rhyme, which came out Rhyme came out what, last October or so. Yes, because we started running games in the fall. No, it came out september because tasha's came out in november right um and rhyme uh, is really tight like i was looking at it today we talk about it a lot when we were doing um sort of an overview of like what's out there and like current content and uh the latest book that we're putting together this giant beast of a book is borrows a lot from the structure of like uh the way rhyme runs so like i, I really like that they've really kind of focused on that um I think the big thing that makes fifth edition successful is that it's very good at um, dopamine. <laughs> it and does. It, it, by that I mean, loop. like it's, it's really good at, um, I would say like, it's good at dopamine and like Call of Cthulhu is good at adrenaline, right? <laughs> Call of Cthulhu is good at scaring the shit out of you and making that feeling, you know, your fight or flight, but D and D is all about like, finding the cool story hooks while you're in it, uh, winning the victories, and then immediately getting some sort of reward for it. And then those rewards pay off in the form of levels, which gets you additional bonuses and stuff. 
And I think without that system, I don't think it would be nearly as successful, which is why you will probably never see d d get rid of classes, just because those classes are what really drive the story. And ultimately, I mean, we'll probably get into more talks about the philosophy of like the way the game's built, but I'd say that, you know, there's really only, there's secretly only 10 classes in D&D and like some of them are like just carrots to drive you through the early levels. But that's probably a discussion for another time. But I, I think it's it's just a brilliantly designed system. It's very neat and clean. It's very easy to learn, especially fifth edition uh, compared to like third edition, which was, you know, Modifier City. Second edition, which was just a hot mess of supplements. And then, you know, first edition, which was just kind of like uh, fight 100 goblins. You'll probably die, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, yeah, like I, I, I really think fifth edition is pretty hot. Um, I would argue that I, I'm also like as much as I like it, I really like BRP uh, and Chaosium. He does. He, he talks about a basic role play system all the time. Yeah, I think it's really cool, and I think it's really nice and tidy. I, I like more like adrenaline and tension games, but that's just me. Maybe that's the old man in me. Um, I think but, so because I, I guess a fifth edition player. I would say the reason why I have gravitated to D&D consistently, despite everything else out there, because again, like Dave's been playing D&D since I was one. I've only been playing D&D <laughs> since I You're was 25. Charged, yeah. <laughs> um, the big thing for me with D&D is it's really legible and it does a good job helping the DM get content in front of the players. One of my frustrations with other, and sometimes it's just that D&D has a lot of momentum that carries it through because there's so many of us developing content for D&D that it's pretty easy to drop things in but I also think that's part of the point is D&D especially fifth edition has really good ways to get the players moving and the DM going and a lot of the other systems out there despite how good they are, are not really good at helping the DM who has to craft content start in the first place. I think a lot of, I think if you're like me, like I am lazy. I don't want to <laughs> do a lot of work to get D&D &D moving. Yeah. I don't, I sometimes get frustrated with the asymmetry of D&D &D, where as a DM, I'll be prepping new content for players for anywhere from one to four hours to try and plan out a couple of sessions of content for them. And the players can't really contribute to that. They have to show up and be ready to play, but there isn't a lot that players can do earnestly to help the DM build the next adventure for them. Uh, they can make sure that they're telegraphing pretty clearly to their DM. This is what I want to do with my character. Like, hey, we just saved all of those people from the town. There was an abandoned keep there. I really want to rebuild that and protect these people. And I can build content in response to, okay, we want to protect them. Well, I'm going to threaten them. Uh, yeah. so, and I think D&D &D mm -hmm. feeds that loop really well. And I think it more than anything, because d and is mature, like we're in the fifth edition, we understand how mechanics work. We've figured out how a saving throw should work, how an attack roll should work. D&D's mechanics make a lot of sense once you understand the fundamentals inside of them. And it's very easy for the players and the DMs to have a back and forth. And as much as we talk about role play at the table and wanting people to embody their characters, a lot of people who come to D&D in the first place are really awkward and not maybe necessarily the greatest socialites in the first place. And I think D&D does a good job letting people who are nervous about role play or maybe not as performative in role play let them feel like they're contributing to the narrative they're participating in because D, &D asks them very concrete choices because D, D is so action oriented because so many of its features are about hitting things in the first place so i think D, &D mm -hmm. is very good at helping the players make their choices and make their choices feel like they matter in terms of the objectives that have been laid out in front of them and despite the really cool ideas in a lot of other systems out there, some of the, I don't want to call it anybody because I want to bash the system. I think a lot of the role play centric <laughs> systems are really good at helping people who are, who naturally have a lot of improv skill, but they don't often do a good job helping people lay out stuff if they're a little bit nervous or they don't have that in their kit already. Yeah. Yeah. Well, not even LARPing. LARPing LARPers. can be really fun. But again, like LARPers are incredibly creative people. They make a lot of their own costumes. They <clears> yeah. develop their own characters in the first place. Um, and they they embody their own sense of rules really well when they're 
performing. Uh, LARPers yeah. are really, really talented. Um, and I think D and D does a good job, like feeding that. I think D and D is a place where a lot of us start. I don't necessarily think we should stop at D and D. I think people would gain a lot from playing other games. Oh yeah, often because yeah. it gives you better perspective. Yeah, but it's I really easy. Of... It does a good job holding your hand and getting you moving. Yeah, for sure. It's I think it's the definitely the most the best entry level game. I mean, there's some simpler versions, you know, but I think in terms of like, if you're an adult um, and especially if you've played some board games, I think it's the simplest one because it all runs on a D20 at the end of the day, right? And it's always, you know, it's it kind of got rebranded as the D20 system back in like 99, 2000 when they started 3.0 and 3.5. Um, so it's really simple and, and just tidy. Um, and I think most of the other systems that have been successful, they also have had similar, like ultimately like Chaosium, for example, is the D100, you know, percent, percentile dice is everything in that, but it's still the same theory. You roll percentile dice as your, um, as your task resolution system, but then you roll other dice, to, you know, as, as to see like damage and, and shit like that and for stats. So um, anyways, yeah, I, th I think, I think that's what makes D&D so great is it is really accessible. All right. Our last question, Sarge. The famous question. The reason we started this pod quest. <laughs> pod, pod quest. It's a pod quest. It's a pod quest now. Oh, damn. I'm TMing that. <laughs> TM. <laughs> oh, people will likely ask, why is the name of the show <laughs> Read the Fucking DMG? Why should they be reading it? Uh, Yeah, why should you read the DMG? Well... <laughs> first of all it's a core rule book um so that's kind of it's it's a strange thing and i realized i realized okay let me let me say this like i understand like not everybody can afford them i mean these books are 50 bucks msrp 30 if you get them on amazon even if you try to buy them on like dnd beyond you know they ain't cheap um so i dig it right there's there's financial like shit um that comes into it but um i would say nine out of 10 questions, maybe even, maybe I should 95 out of a hundred questions, <laughs> 19 out of 20, if you will, roll a 19, um, DC 19. All right. That's enough of that. Um, <laughs> that we get can be answered by reviewing the DMG. And, um, it, it's an interesting thing because a lot of people obviously know they have to understand the player's handbook though. I, I suspect that most players who play D and D have, never really read the player's handbook no they just absorb the game by osmosis from playing. right 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 <laughs> they, they they play a game they kind of learn the basics and they go from there and if they get a rule wrong some blowhard at the table will like tell them you know they screwed up right uh, i'm that guy <laughs> i think sarge is that guy too um i am lawful neutral i rule against the party a lot <laughs> yeah yeah and there's a lot of there's a i mean let's face it these books are 350 pages two columns each with about a, a thousand 500 to a thousand words on it it's a lot of reading you know it's textbook it's a textbook like a college textbook um just cheaper than a college textbook <laughs> and the the there's there's a lot to learn and know so it's hard to follow and adding the dmg to that which i think to a lot of people is just a bunch of magic items wrapped by wrapped around some other shit um or uh, uh is you know add to that and then interesting i find a lot of people don't even have the monster manual which i'm like how, how do you play the game without the monster manual it's weird you just Granted, buy pre-built stuff are... you don't need it it's in the back of the, yeah, the adventure they, module yeah I guess. Um, so anyways, <laughs> yeah, that's uh, uh, the DMG has a lot of amazing content in it. Um, when I started getting into doing what I do, uh, I started with monster making and there's, you know, there's an entire chapter devoted just to how to make monsters. Um, granted, I, I would say that some of it is kind of confusing and it is definitely a little bit more complicated than understanding like, you know, rules. We talked about accessibility with uh, Dungeons and Dragons fifth edition, but the DMG has some content in it that is not necessarily accessible. Um, the CR system is, can be kind of confusing for people. Um, it's like, what, what does one half mean? Like, what is the do? Is that I throw two at people and it equals one, you know, it's, it's, it, there's multipliers you have to consider uh if there's too many players you have to adjust those multipliers up or down uh, you know or if there's too few players 
um and then you have to build it all within the daily adventuring xp which is on a whole another page with a whole another table it's really it's really complicated and the way it's laid out and the same way with uh, making monsters like those those two you know those columns that you have for offensive and defensive like having to average them out it's a lot right so um it, it's i get like the trepidation with it um but as far as if you want to do like be a professional game master um especially or if you want to create content you really need to know the dmg um i have come across people who are in this this line of work with me uh who made a monster and it's a mess and i'm like not that mine are any better mind you but <laughs> at least i try to balance mine they uh, uh they would be like uh with his actual quote guy, he's like, "Oh, I just thought you went with your gut when making them." I'm like, "What? No, no." <laughs> Two seventy two of the DNG. <laughs> There's very specific rules, man. Um, but yeah, but like adventure writing, all that stuff. Um, I'm teaching an adventure writing course right now, and um, you know, the, the big thing I tell people is like, chapter three of the DMG covers all this shit, and I use I use it religiously like i follow exactly what they tell me to do i've always done that uh granted you know i've i've studied and and incorporated other things that i've observed by reading all the venture modules but for the most part everything i do is right out of the dmg there's no mystery it's true we don't really obfuscate that when we talk about that i think it's really as simple as this like whenever a player is asking a question at the table about how a feature works the important thing to do is, is show them where to find it in the php like how does the spell work? Well, you look it up. It's in chapter, I believe, 10 on spells in the PHP. And you show them where to get it. If they're curious about how does the spell work, like what's the, what's the VSNM mean? You take them to chapter nine about how spell casting works. And then chapter, they can do that. Chapter nine is combat, but yeah. <laughs> no, so the spells in 11? Yeah, spell lists are 10. Spells descriptions are 11. <laughs> I'm about to go. Now I'm about to go pull it up because I get it wrong sometimes. <laughs> Don't you <laughs> test me. <laughs> I don't know. I could be wrong. I'm probably wrong. I'll get out of yeah, but I mean, like, you know where to go in the PHB to show people how this stuff works. And it's the same yeah. thing as a dungeon master. We get, there's basically two questions we get in, uh, in the various ways people reach out to us. It's basically, how do I run some complex mechanical aspect of D&D? Or how do I structure content for my players? And then how do I manage the social drama at my table? And we don't mind offering a lot of personal perspective on how to manage social drama at your table. But most of the time, our answer is, why don't you just ask the players directly and talk about how you're feeling? You're a player at the table, too. We usually stress that to the, the new DMs we get a lot is, you are a player. How you feel matters just as much as how the players feel. Um, but when a lot of times we get asked mechanical questions, we're just like, well, open up chapter three of the DMG and that's how you structure an adventure. I don't know, I need to create an NPC, but I'm uninspired. Open up chapter four of the DMG. I need to make a dungeon. Where am I gonna put my players? Open up chapter five of the DMG. Yeah. What do I put inside of the, the dungeon when I get there? Go to the appendices of the DMG. Uh, I gotta run like 12 creatures in this combat. What do I do? Go to the appendices on combat options that you can do. Mm -hmm. That's where you get the mob yeah. rules. How do I handle social stuff? The DMG has guidance on how to adjust an encounter based upon what the party says. It says basically, if they say something really cool, move the NPC from hostile to indifferent and then roll. If they become indifferent, here's what they will do based on standard DCs. And it's pretty straightforward. I think the problem that happens with the DMG for people is most of us read books like novels. So we open it up and the DMG, I think is organized appropriately in a sort of like wide level to narrow level but i kind of wish it wasn't i kind of wish the dmg started with like here's what you need in a town let's build your starter town and your starter dungeon we'll worry about your world later instead of the dmg overwhelming people by making them start with their world or making them start with a campaign because that's hard a little bit like what's the theme of your campaign going to be like that's kind of a a huge thing to start off right away like the players are just level one they're just gonna get jumped by goblins <laughs> let's, let's, start, <laughs> let's start there um yeah. and that's i think what happens a lot like the chapter we usually direct people to the most is chapter three but if people are reading chapters one and two of the dmg earnestly they're gonna get overwhelmed i think and bounce off the dmg yeah yeah it's got a weird structure because it like goes it starts off with some like ideas and then i think it goes into like 
world building and like details yeah. the planes and it's like i mean i'm like well i'm gonna homebrew my own world so why do i need to know the inner planes and the ethereal plane and you know so i dig it but yeah i think um i think that's the biggest problem it suffers from it's just it's just it's shitty organized right <laughs> um they put so many things that are so valuable in the appendices too which just drives me nuts the php yeah like, like why I are think, the conditions in the appendix like come on <laughs> i think that's the real i think that's the big problem like i think like I, I just said, like I think it just starts too big, because mm -hmm. the the best guidance I think I ever got on was he I got a combination of advice from you and I think Matt Colville. Matt Colville is just like start with the town, put a dungeon nearby. You're playing D and D, and then you have you I had a use I, for and it. I don't even say start with the town. It's just like you're at the dungeon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Dave will say, Dave's old school. He's like, there's a dungeon. You can go to the town after you finish. To my horse, baby. Ain't no town. <laughs> but a hill looks like a skull. Look out for that green door. <laughs> you can actually see a lot of the, for, as a, just a quick aside, you can see a lot of that design in Prince of the Apocalypse. Big dungeons, yeah. barely relevant town. <laughs> I tried to expand it. I mean, it's it's basically Temple of Elemental Evil, but yeah. Um, you know, uh, definitely Dungeon of the Mad Mage. I mean, that's exactly what it is. But I think if we had to stress anything to you all, it would be if you're going to be a dungeon master, you shouldn't read the DMG like a novel, but you really need to open up its table of contents. You really need to flip through the sections and know what's inside of it. Like there's all sorts of little stuff in the DMG. I'll forget is in it and then I'll pull it up randomly because someone mentioned it or I saw like a YouTube video on it or something where someone hyper-focused on a specific side of the DMG. I think it's important. We mentioned that D&D is weird because you get three textbooks to run. Like you would never read your math textbook or your English textbook. You read <laughs> what your teacher, I was a teacher. You read what your teacher tells yeah. you to read. Yeah. Go read the chapter on this particular war. We're going to talk about it this week. Yeah. Um, and it's the same with the DMG. Like when you're, if you feel like you, like if you're running an adventure for your players, very earnestly, let's say you're running, what's an adventure that's kind of chunky that you'd have to do stuff. Lost Mine of Fandelver is actually a great example of that. Lost Mine of Fandelver gives you a series of side quests that have open-ended hooks. That the party's like, we want to go get Bow Gentle Spell Book. Well, there's the hook of your next adventure. You've opened up the DMG. The party's goal already is we're going to find that book because we want to get those spells. And then you can figure mm -hmm. out where it's going to go. Where do you want to take your players? And you can start using the tables in the DMG to flesh that out. Maybe we're going to send them to the east. Maybe we'll send them to... What's that elven city to the east in, in the Sword Coast? Uh, Silvery Moon. Silvery Moon. Yeah, maybe you'll send them to Silvery Moon. Moon. Yeah. Maybe they'll go into the forest south of Silvery Moon looking for Bow Gentle Spellbook. I don't know. Maybe there's a secret dungeon that he got lost in trying to stop something. Roll up your DMG and you can roll out chapter four and roll out why this old dungeon existed. Why did he die in that dungeon? Who killed him? Go to the monster manual. What's a, what's a big creature that could kill... A wizard who maybe got outflanked. Maybe it was an Arcanaloth that punked him out. It's Edder Cap. Just one. Definitely. Edder cap. Definitely one Edder Cap Corroded got him. him. <laughs> All right. Well, we are <laughs> we are creeping up on I think we're past 30 minute mark, but oh okay. we did it, as always. We did it. But uh now thanks, thanks everybody for tuning in. I hope this is informative. Hopefully, this will be so popular. <laughs> we'll be back. Like we'll like people will be like Matt who? uh dm dave and sarge but yeah we'll be back uh make sure to like this video subscribe and if you're so inclined and you want to have a question for us become a patron at dm dave um patreon patreon.com forward slash dm dave it's like three dollars just to get in and get like a shit ton of pdfs plus the ability to ask us questions and talk to us on the discord anyways people we will see you later remember Read the fucking DMG. <laughs> Please. <laughs> <laughs> Later.